when I air down on a motorcycle, how much am I actually changing the footprint on the tire? We don't need scientific experimentation to see that these tires are very different sizes. This 120, 60, 17, compared to this 90, 90, 21, well, it's clear just by looking at the tires that this tire has significantly larger footprint, a lot more rubber on the road. Or does it? Looking at those two tires side by side, and here's where I was absolutely shocked and wrong. I believed that that 120 would absolutely have a much larger surface area, but it's not as big as I thought. When I'm looking at the two of these, the 120 had a width advantage of 11 millimeters. It's that wide. The one, the 90-90-21 had a length advantage of nine millimeters. The difference on these was minuscule. They had almost the same surface area and the changes on decreasing air pressure were marginal and consistent from one tire to the other. Now, I'm not saying that air pressure isn't important we're all going to agree that air pressure matters. And certainly the, the testing that I did confirmed that to be the case. We're not talking about increasing surface area to increase traction. That's already a busted myth. Airing down has more effect than just the tire blowing out. We don't, we're not riding on balloons. Tires are far more complex than that. I air down because when I'm in sand, I can, I can get up on top of the sand because I have more surface area so I can climb up and ride on top of the sand. Front tire versus rear tire. This is a 120-21 at 32 PSI on the front of an F800 GS. This is a 140-80-17 at 36 PSI on the rear of that same motorcycle. This is the recommended air pressure from both the tire manufacturer and from the motorcycle manufacturer. If we only focus on the front tire and I increase it to the minimum pressure needed to get the maximum load capacity of 41 PSI, I lose approximately two pennies and one quarter worth of surface area. If I decrease it from 32 PSI down 10% to 28.8 PSI, the area that I gain is the area left that's silver. That's approximately two dimes worth the surface area. If I drop it an additional 10%, so we are now 20% below the recommended 32 PSI, down to 25.6 PSI, the increase in surface area from negative 10 to negative 20 is one dime. When we go off-road and we say, all right, I air down off-road because my tire then can form and conform around the rocks and around obstacles and I have better traction. The most important argument when we're talking about off-roading is flex. Now, flexing matters in off-roading when we start talking about keen, which is what you'll see when you look at four by four guys talk about off-roading. And again, that's the ability for them to air down to almost nothing in the tire so that the tire forms and wraps and gums around the rocks that they're climbing up. And then indentation. Indentation is very similar to that, but indentation is generally considered the ability for the rubber, for the, uh, for the pliability of the rubber to wrap around the rocks and the inconsistencies in pavement. So indentation and keen are often used interchangeably and I may do the same, but really when you think about keen, that's larger flex in the tire where indentation is smaller changes. These are the two primary arguments for airing down. The other one being, well, I want to air down so when I hit things I have a softer impact because if I have too much air that the bike will deflect and bounce off of obstacles. Those are the arguments. So we built a six inch obstacle made of wood, less likely to damage the rim as we aired things down. Technique wise, there was zero. 
All I did was set a consistent speed and let the bike plow over. No blipping the throttle, no braking, no shifting weight. That way it was very consistent. It didn't take long before we realized there was no way we were going to be able to measure the actual surface area or the compression of the sidewall. But there were two observations that came out of it that we weren't noticing until we started reviewing the videos. The first one we kind of expected. When it was at full pressure on the front wheel or the front tire versus the recommended pressure, we did notice that the bike, the front tire, would deflect off the, the other side and it would take longer to recover. It wasn't terrible, but it was noticeable. From the recommended pressure to 10 or 20 percent below the recommended, we didn't notice a huge difference. There was nothing we could see. But we did find that once we got down to 30, 40, and 50 percent below the recommended amounts, that the bike started hitting substantially harder. When I looked at the front tires and the back tires on a graph to see if there was a linear change or if it had sudden spikes, what I found were a couple of patterns. One is, when I looked at the rear tires specifically, I saw not a lot of change from the maximum load pressure to the recommended, if there was a difference, and then to the 20% mark. But I did notice on both of those a significant spike in surface area at 30%. This also corresponded with our observations when we did the slow motion riding over the obstacles. We noticed that after 20%, when we got to the 30%, that the bikes hit really hard. You could hear it, you could feel it, and we had to do resets on the obstacle each time. So for me, looking at that, that 20% seems to be the threshold which is also consistent with the motorcycle manufacturers and their recommendations. Those that do air down seldom go beyond that 20%. They're around, on the large bikes, they're all less than 20%. On the smaller, mid-size 800 bikes, they may go into the 20%, but not to 30. When we look at the front tires, there was a, a spike in surface area from the maximum load pressure to the recommended pressures. And none of the manufacturers that I found, and neither of the tires that I tested or the manufacturers of the bikes I tested, used the maximum load capacity on the front tire. Both of those had lower tire pressures than the maximum. After that, it was fairly consistent on our 21, the 120, 70, 19, was relatively consistent with a uh, sudden increase in surface area going to the recommended pressure for maximum, but also a very sudden change at that 30% and beyond. And that was definitely a pattern that I picked up on. So uh, up to that 20%, there was a fairly linear change. At 30, there was a sudden change, but also a negative effect when we were doing the slow motion video capture. We don't ride on tires, we ride on air. The air is in the tire. And if you don't have enough air, then it will end up impacting the rim. We can damage dent rims. If you have too much air, then there's not enough flex in the tire and then you end up just bouncing off of things. That tire needs to have a certain amount of stability. And if the tire shifts and moves too much because it doesn't have stability in the sidewall, well, the tire ends up wobbling and the bike feels wobbly. If you've ever had a flat tire, you'll know exactly what that feels like. And although it's not necessarily as noticeable when you're off-road and we already have surface that allows us to move around, it absolutely can cause the bike to be less stable. There was a significant decrease in performance as we got down to that 30, 40, 50% with impact protection, with deflection, and certainly with feel. Obviously, this 170 60, 17 on a four and a half inch rim on a 600 pound motorcycle is going to have more contact area and a larger footprint than this 140 80 17 on a four and a quarter inch rim on a lighter 500 pound bike. But if we believe that, we'd be wrong. Looking at the rear tires on the motorcycles, 
and airing down, I found the same pattern as I did with the front tires, which is that as I aired down, the gains were marginal as far as footprint. And after I hit about 30%, I saw a small spike and that continued down to 50%. But I couldn't help to notice that the difference between the 140 and the 170 was reversed as opposed to what I believed. And when I looked at the recommended pressures, the difference in width between the 170, 60, 17 and the 140, 80, 17 was less than one millimeter. But the difference in length gave the 140, the tire that is smaller on a narrow, narrower rim and on a smaller motorcycle, it had a 27 millimeter length advantage. Even though it was the smaller tire, the lighter bike, the narrower rim, it also had the largest footprint. Looking at the results of the front tires, the 120 versus the 90, I was absolutely shocked at the results. Now the original question was simply, how much surface area do we gain when we decrease or increase pressure. And the difference is relatively small. When we looked at the 90 profile and the 120, we're looking at a width from the maximum load pressure to the recommended pressure of approximately three millimeters in width on the 90 profile and about 19 millimeters in length. Now that's the most substantial gain that tire got, was going from that maximum to the recommended. The 120 went from less than one millimeter in width to approximately 10 millimeters in length. Remember there's a standard deviation of approximately one millimeter in width and two millimeters in length that, that could be error on here. As we went down to minus 10%, we're just a little over two millimeters in length on the 90 with six millimeters, or I'm sorry, two millimeters in width with six millimeters in length. And on the 120, we're less than one millimeter in width and approximately seven millimeters in length. The negative 20% is less than two millimeters in width for the 90, around two millimeters for the 120 and about five millimeters in length on the 120 and four millimeters in length on the 90. The point is, as we decrease pressure, we're really not gaining that much surface area. We're gaining flex, we're gaining the ability for heat, there's other things that change. But if your whole sole argument is, I want my tire to have more surface area so I can conform to the surface and I can float on top, what I'm not seeing is these dramatic changes that are gonna make a difference. Once I observed that both the data showed a significant change in the tire at around 30%. And when we did the slow motion video and we were watching it, we also noticed both through the video and during recording that we had a significant decrease in performance once we hit that 30, 40, and 50% uh, below the recommended pressures. I started asking the question, what do the manufacturers what do they recommend? How much are they actually airing down? We see what the pressures are, but do we know what the percentages is? So I collected a database of motorcycles and I recorded the recommended pressure for solo, what the percentage was to increase to a maximum load, and when available, how much do we decrease from that recommended solo street pressure down to dirt pressure? What I found is the manufacturers follow that same pattern. The front tires, if they aired down at all, and most of the very large bikes, the leader class motorcycles, they didn't air down at all. But when there were air downs in the things like the 890, the Tenere 700, uh, the, the Ducati Desert X, that those pressures on the front were generally relatively low, somewhere between 7% to 10%, maybe a little more. And on the rear tires, we're somewhere in the 14 to 17%. Once we got to off-road pressures, we did see, or I did notice a pattern of some manufacturers dropping greater than minus 20%, and meaning 22% and 26%. These higher percentage of drops were almost exclusively KTM motorcycles, so the 890, the, uh, the 690, and those bikes. 
All the others seem to be less than 20%, which is consistent with the observations in both data collection and the observations we made during the slow motion measuring the impact of those tires going over the obstacles. Here's what the takeaway is. Am I saying that there is no advantage to airing down off-road? I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that these tires are far more complex than just air in a tire. There is an ideal performance range for both that tire and for the motorcycle. And the heavier the motorcycle, the more air you need to ride on to protect that bike. The tire manufacturers and the OEMs understand what that performance is. And I do have calls out to several manufacturers for both tires and for bikes to try to see what is their criteria? How do they measure their recommendations? And Ducati and Pirelli have both said they're interested in giving me feedback and helping me get some inside scoop on that. I'm still waiting for that meeting to get that inside information, but there is definitely a pattern there. Also, <clears throat> if your argument is that you're going to air down so you get a larger footprint, so you can get up on top of the sand or up on top of the surface, the changes that you get are small. One to three, maybe four millimeters in width. And in length, those changes are also going to be small. Definitely not enough to cause a 500 or 600 pound adventure bike to float on top of the surface. So that myth is pretty well busted. If you believe that as you ride over different obstacles that your tire is going to wrap around that obstacle and grab a hold of it and grip it and ride and, and like claws or some kind of magic formula, well, there's definitely nothing substantiating that belief also. It doesn't mean that having the right pressure isn't important. The higher pressures will cause you to deflect more. It will change the way the bike hooks up. But also, if you air down too much, you're also getting negative effects. Your performance will go down. Your stability will go down. Your traction can go down. The idea is to get into that proper range. Thanks for watching the channel. If you would like to say uh, thank you to the channel, make a short contribution, you can do that through YouTube. Click the three dots below the video and it'll come up with the thanks button. You can make a one-time contribution. Also, if you want a long-term uh, commitment to help me continue to produce these videos and to stay uh, free of sponsorship, then you can do that through Patreon. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Hit the bell so you get notice on the next video. Thanks for watching. See you guys next time.